Welcome to episode 138 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live August 9th, 2019. This is a show about Office 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. In today's episode, we go down a PowerShell rabbit hole in which we discuss a recent PowerShell struggle Scott is trying to solve. We eventually make our way out of the rabbit hole to discuss recent Azure AD, Office 365, and SharePoint news and announcements. Coffee is key. I am halfway into my second cup because I was up at 5 a.m. writing and writing. 5 a.m.? Well, so my kid was up at, my youngest was up at like 4, 4.30 and he didn't go back to sleep. So my wife was like, we have this thing. My son will fall asleep in my lap, but not my wife's lap. So she can sit with him in the chair for like an hour and he'll be wide awake and doing all this. I'll take him and literally five minutes later, he'll be passed out in my lap. So at 5 a.m., she's like, here, do your magic. And I go sit in the chair with him for two minutes and he's passed out, laying back down. And then I got up and did some work for a couple hours. (laughs) But it's Friday, so you, you get to leave work early then. Yeah, something like that. No. Not so much. The desk is still going to be there. Yes. And being as working from home, you never actually leave work. You just leave your computer. And some slave driver is making me do a whole bunch of writing. I don't know who that is. Yeah, yeah. Well, the things that you take on in your spare time. (laughs) No, the things I take on and I didn't have as much spare time as I thought I did is usually more it. But <laughs> <laughs> turns out turns out I actually don't have as much time as I thought I did. Oh well. Such is life. Oh well. Obstility is disrupting cloud training as we know it with their on-demand platform Skill Me Up. Their new design focuses on a user flow to better support role-based learning paths with these great new features. Real-time, hands-on labs are now included with each subscription to build your skills competence. Hundreds of cloud courses with more added daily to transform your skills for today's cloud-first careers. Role-based learning paths guide you through associated level courses in an easy-to-view layout and tracker. Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365 certification prep courses and labs to support you leading up to exam day. Learn more and start your free three-day trial at www.skillmeup.com. Should we get into our topic for this morning? Or our topics? I guess Multiple topics. Our news topics. We're going to do two news episodes in a row because... We can. Kind of, sort of. I'm going to rant for a second first. So I found out something interesting this week, which really kind of, sort of, very much annoys me. So it is, um, you do PowerShell, right? Yes. Yep. I think lots of us probably do things like run PowerShell inside of scheduled tasks sometimes. Sometimes. So maybe inside of like like Windows Task Scheduler. Yes. Yeah, you just have this job you want to kick off on a regular schedule and hey, it's got to go do some data munching or whatever it needs to do. Yeah, I've set up a fair amount of those. Yeah, so something that does not work and or at least I'm fundamentally missing the way to make it work inside of PowerShell scripts that are executed through uh, scheduled tasks because they execute in the context of whatever account the job runs in and they're they're effectively totally in the background right they're they're non-windowed and yep. you know they don't have any of that that context so something that breaks inside of them is jobs So, you know, when you can go and do something like maybe start job and start a background task, or maybe you do start thread job or, you know, something like that. So they work, so it'll start the job. But as soon as it starts the job, even if you have the job assigned to, say, an array or however you happen to start it, as soon as it starts, like, and you get to the very next line in your function, or you leave your function, like I was running a bunch of jobs in a function, you know, wrote all this stuff in the ISE and it's all up and it's ready to go. And it comes out and it loses that scope. All the 
background jobs just die. <laughs> so nothing ever actually runs, nothing ever actually starts because functions just run so quick, right? You call the function and it does like right. the two lines of code it needs to do, which is effectively a start job. And then it's out of the function and boom, it's all dead and nothing's there. There's not actually any jobs running in context because they're all in the background on this system thing and blah, blah, blah. So I spent like three days this week trying to figure out how to make background, trying to make jobs or thread jobs work inside of PowerShell in a scheduled task. And I read all these blog posts on the internet and they're like, oh, you just do this. You just got to have a context to this. You just store it in this array. You go ahead and pop it into this uh, hash table and then pull it out from over here and do this and blah. None of that crap works. They are all lies. So I'm trying to think through why that would be. Is it because when you do it as a task and it kind of like spins up the session, but then as soon as it finishes that script, it kills it. It like kills all the PowerShell sessions in the background. Is that why it kills the jobs? Yes, it kills everything. So then you think, well, hey, maybe I could do like start process. Right. But that's kind of annoying too, because then you have to manage all the state for that thing yourself. So how do you manage state of a running task? Are you going to maybe like write a file out to the file system to say this thing's done? Are you going to create a registry key? Do you have a database you can write to? It just becomes a lot of overhead to do like a very simple thing. So the moral of the story was now it's just a bunch of serial process because that seems to work. It just takes six hours longer than it needs to. (laughs) Thank you, PowerShell. I have an idea. Azure automation hybrid mode and running your scheduled jobs out there and seeing if you can thread them in Azure automation to run them on-prem. I totally could, but what we're trying to do here is, uh, or, or what I'm trying to do is bootstrap a server in Azure. So it's a you know a big old DS and 16 like V3 okay. server. And then it comes up and it create, it uses embedded Hyper-V. So it installs the Hyper-V role, it does all that stuff. And then it goes and grabs a bunch of guest VMs and downloads them from just, storage or wherever it's grabbing them okay. from. So that all works great. Like that's all set. That's really quick, right? Boom, 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 snap through and do that. What kills is they're all in storage zipped up, all the VHDs for the okay. guests. So you have to go at, you have to go ahead and unzip them. So uh, the only reliable way to unzip in PowerShell on Windows is using com objects. So you use like shell.application and use like a, a copy motion and with a you know, hey, here's my source, my destination, all that kind yep. of stuff. Because you would think, hey, PowerShell has zip and unzip built into it. It does, except it can't zip and unzip every archive because it has a bunch of memory errors. It also things that like shell.application is able to unzip. Express Arc, expand archive just says, hey, the zip is corrupt. So then you're like, okay, well, if I can't use PowerShell, I can use the shell, which is always there. Or I would have to reach out and use some other type of thing. So I would have to use maybe like 7-zip or WinRAR, or, you know, maybe just like a, a portable version of those, which would be fine. But then it's another thing that you have to download. It's another dependency you have, which just every Windows server has shell.application, right? Because it's just built into Explorer and kind of ready to go and sitting there. So it's downloading these VHDs isn't the problem. It's expanding them. That's killer because, you know, it's a whatever, a five gig zip file. But when it expands out, it's 40 gigs. So streaming all that even to multiple disks on on an Azure VM, like you run into disk latency, you get throughput things. And then it works awesome if you can parallelize it with start job inside just like a script you wrote in the ISE. Because that just works, but then you take your script you wrote in the ISC and it all blows up in your face when it runs in a scheduled task. Interesting. Is there a way to keep the process open and like monitor the job statuses? Like almost put like a for each loop after you start the job to keep PowerShell open while it's running all the jobs and then kill it all once all the job statuses are complete or something. Yeah, I did that. And as soon as you run the start job, it exits like the for loop. And even if you try and do like start job and then have a for loop that runs after it, the job just isn't there. That's bizarre. It's wonky to debug it because you don't have like a window sitting up in front of you, right? So you can do things like maybe like start transcript, stop transcript, try and capture it to a file right. and all that. But it's just, a, it's a pain to debug what is a script that takes on a good day. You know, say I could parallelize it all. It takes 30 minutes to run. On, your debug cycle is pretty long to go ahead to, and get yeah. through it. So, Have you tried so. PowerShell Core to see if PowerShell Core behaves any differently? That would be another dependency that I'd have to pull down and bootstrap into that server, though. 
to go ahead and get it up and running because Windows doesn't have PowerShell core on it by default. So I'd have to grab my server from the gallery, you know, my Windows server, whatever image, and then bootstrap that in. So it's trying to find this balance between how much, how many dependencies you want to actually pull in on that yep. server and then kind of what your taste is just to run it. And it's not the end of the world that it takes two hours to bootstrap this server. Like it's for student labs and things like that. So it's okay. It would just be really nice if it ran quicker, right? So like what I was running in my debug cycles, it'd be great if it ran in 30 minutes. I don't care if it takes two hours to run because really what I can do is I can just make sure I start all the labs two hours early for right. everybody. And then you just it. have to remember to start it two hours early then but instead that, of like when you come in that morning to teach and you just fire them all off. If you did it then they may not be done in time or something. Yep. So yeah, no, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all sorts of so all sorts of fun, and you know, people don't think I do anything, but this is what I do. I play with PowerShell all week. Sounds like fun, ish, sort of. Not really, ish. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think other PowerShell would be more fun. But if anybody has any ideas about that one, I would love to hear. Like, hey, here's how I solved running things with Start Job or Start Thread Job in a Windows scheduled task that actually worked and wasn't a blog post that was written like two years ago on the internet. You know, we do put all these links on Reddit and things like that. So I'd, I'd love to have some feedback maybe over there through the contact form or something. Tell me how I am being dumb and obtuse in my approach to this. Yes. Why don't you just email Jeffrey? Ask him, ask Snover how to do it. Don't you know him? Aren't you on like a first name basis? That's true. That was well. He doesn't do a lot of PowerShell anymore. He runs like AI or something like that. Yeah, he's he's doing like Office AI now. You know, it's the man's busy. <laughs> you're not you're not on like a first name basis with him, and just go hang out with him every once in a while. <sighs> not yet. Maybe we should do an interview at Ignite maybe, this year. Maybe we should. See how it goes. Yeah, if you're listening, or if anybody knows Jeffrey Snover and wants to hook us up with him. It'd be kind of a fun interview to do. Seems like a pretty cool guy. I've heard him speak a few times, but like you, I have never actually met him or hung out with him at any level. So that was a bit of a rant. I'm usually the ranty one. <laughs> well, that's been my, like I said, my frustration for the week. All right. So now that you have gotten the frustration off your chest, at least that frustration off your chest, do you want to talk about some news or do you have other frustrations? Do we need to turn this into a counseling session for Scott? to vent all of his frustrations. Because you have had other frustrations this morning too. Albeit not all technical frustrations. I could stick to technical ones. What else do you want to hear about this week? I could tell you how Azure DevOps is just an evil tool sometimes. You know, I could tell you how Ooh, GitHub. Uh, I've been having a bunch of fun trying to figure out how, why, like all my GitHub credentials are screwed up and trying to switch from like HTTP to SSH credentials and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Turns out that, you know, authentication is hard, even in, even in Git. Even in Git. How about Instagram tracking your every move or a third party? You scraping Instagram data. Did you hear about this one? Oh, that's. Like old hat, people do that stuff all the time. If this you was, put stuff on the, internet, on the internet, you have to make the assumption that is being used in a nefarious way by someone this else. This was like a big article that came out because this company was essentially violating Instagram's terms of services or terms of service. I can't find it now. It's in my chats somewhere. Yeah, that was uh, that was hyper. Yes, right? it was mapping like everybody's locations and all of that. There was a big old article on Forbes. Nope. That was Apple. Forbes was an Apple. Anyways. You're thinking Business Insider. <laughs> yes, that was probably where I saw it. There was something else I saw that was interesting this morning. I can't remember. That's what happened. See, we're all sidetracked now. Oh, there was something on <laughs> it's what I'm yeah, here for. there was something on Engadget this morning I saw that I was like, oh, that was kind of interesting. Oh, Google Flight. I somehow missed this. That you can book flights through Google. Google Flights. Did you know about Google Flights? Yes, you can book flights to Google Flights. They also have a price guarantee. Yes, that was the article I saw this morning, that they're going to refund the difference. If the price drops unexpectedly, I don't know how you define if a price drops unexpectedly versus expectedly. Well, yeah, they mean more like precipitous drops. Because one of the things you can do is, you know, you might book a flight two months out, yep. but because variability is so high in the price of flights, that what you pay today, like, Say, I don't know, you and I, we book a flight to Vegas 
in September. <laughs> and Theoretically, hypothetically. <laughs> yeah, so you book that flight and then you come back and two weeks later, what was a $600 flight is now you know, $525. So if you're like on the money and you're monitoring the price of flights yourself, you can go in there and request a credit for that. And some airlines make it really easy. Like Southwest, if you book with Southwest, at least here in the US, you'll just go on and log in and take a look and you look up the new prices like on the same route and it actually just gives you a little button there that you click and it doesn't give you a refund, but it does give you a credit, like an e-credit that comes back. I believe Delta is kind of the same way. I don't know how some of the international carriers are because I don't use them a whole ton. Okay. So this isn't really necessarily an unexpected price drop, but just any price drop because some prices would drop expectedly because, I mean, you see where you book like six, seven, eight months out. They tend to be really expensive and then they kind of drop down. I've noticed like two to three months out and then they seem to kind of climb back up. So I feel like some price drops and some price fluctuations are expected and some are unexpected. And I was kind of curious what the whole flights refunded if there is an unexpected versus an expected drop in price. Yeah, I think they are all unexpected in that context, I guess. I don't don't know. (laughs) Got it. I don't know either. As IT professionals in the cloud era, sometimes it feels like we don't speak the same language as the rest of the organization. So when stakeholders from finance or other departments start asking about a specific project or team's Azure costs, they don't always realize how much work is involved in obtaining that information. Sifting through cluttered CSVs and a complex mass of metadata in order to manually create custom views and reports. It's a real headache. On top of helping you understand and reduce your organization's overall Azure spend, ShareGate Overcast lets you group resources into meaningful cost hubs and map them to real-world business scenarios. This way, you can track costs in the way that makes most sense with your corporate structure, whether it's by product, business unit, team, or otherwise. It's a flexible, intuitive, and business-friendly way of tracking Azure infrastructure costs, and it's only available in ShareGate Overcast. Find out more on sharegate.com slash IT pro. Okay, now I have nothing else to talk about. We could do some news for the next, <laughs> well, we got like 10 or 13 minutes. We can chat about some news. Yeah, no, well, I mean, there, ha- there has been some fun stuff that's happened. There has been some fun stuff. Do you want to pick one or do you want me to pick one? Because we have more than we're going to get through oh. in this episode. Well, stuff, stuff, stuff does happen. Yeah. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. So super, super, super excited to see some new functionality be announced in Azure AD. You know how we end up in this world where maybe you do Azure and you do Azure Active Directory because you have Office 365 or Intune or something like that. And have you ever had to try to explain to somebody the difference between an Azure role and an Azure AD role and why like an Azure customer has this thing called a SharePoint online admin in their <laughs> in their Azure Active Directory. So I have never had anybody dive in deep enough to actually ask me about that, but I can imagine the heartburn that could cause. Yes, yeah, so, so you get these weird things because Azure AD being the identity provider for all of these SaaS systems from Microsoft Microsoft and you know just kind of like where it sits in the ecosystem you end up with all sorts of weird stuff yep. in there. So you get used to kind of putting your identities in Azure and everybody's a user and then you go into into Azure AD where everyone's just in a user role or maybe they're in like a password manager role whatever user administrator and then you get into Azure and you start creating custom roles and then you associate those role assignments with your resources maybe with your resource groups you know you kind of pick your scope subscription resource group resource whatever it happens to be and run it through but one of the things that has not been in place for a very long time uh, it's actually never kind of existed is a con- concept of a custom role inside of Azure AD. So if you think about needing flexibility within actually managing Azure Active Directory, it's been quite rigid. You might find that certain actions necessitate you being a global administrator, but they really only necessitate you being a global administrator because there's one thing, like there's one right that a global administrator has, or or this one access right. Turns out you don't need the other 400, you just needed this one, but you couldn't do it because there was no custom roles. So Microsoft has announced that custom roles are coming through and they're in preview, but right now they're in preview specifically for 
app registration management, but they should be coming down the pike for everything else, which is going to be super cool. So you're going to be able to create these custom roles that have permissions that are based on the Microsoft.directory namespace. You'll be able to create a custom role and then clone it and then change it a little bit. You know, you have super fine-grained permissions within those roles. So it's going to be, I think it'll be a really good thing. When you step into these organizations, I'm sure you do as you work with customers where they've got a ton of global administrators yep. and you kind of roll your eyes and go like, oh, you shouldn't do that or Let's at least buy you PIM, you know, for those users so we can figure that out. I think a lot of that headache will go away with custom roles and custom functionality. Got it. So, like you said, this is only for apps right now. So, you can only scope this to custom apps. You can't set up these custom roles and assign them to specific users or specific groups yet, correct? No, no, no. So, you can create a custom role. Okay. But it can only consume permissions, so you can only assign access rights out of the Microsoft.directory slash applications namespace. So you can create a 100% custom role. You can assign that role to users and groups, just like you would the global admin okay. role or a service admin role, anything else like that. But the only thing that the role can do, the only set of permissions you can give it, relate to application registration. Oh, got it. Right got now. it. Okay. Now I have that straight. I saw like the heading said custom roles for app registration management. And I was, yes, I got it confused. So you can't assign, like you can't go in then and set custom permissions based on SharePoint or Power BI or OneDrive or any of those yet. It's more around those app registration stuff. Correct. Yeah. So that's where it is, but they're not going to stop there. They're just going to keep adding more and more. Yeah. That's the beginning set of permissions. And the stated goal is to continue to release additional permissions for other areas of Azure AD, including enterprise applications, users, groups, and more, Got it. which is going to be super duper nifty. So I think like with anything else, this is one of those like, hey, with great power comes great responsibility. You know, everybody will have to find their balance for where they want to go with how many custom roles they have. Or if, you know, you found app management has been a little bit of a headache or a thorn in your side, you can go ahead and start looking at that today, at least for app registrations. All right. Very cool. So another one that this one is not exciting, but something I threw in here because I figured everybody should at least start paying attention to it. It's kind of like the Teams one, where it might take some people some time to do some migrations to figure out everywhere certain things are in use. But as of June of 2020, so what, we're August now, so 10 months from now or so, TLS version 1.0 and 1.1 are going to be removed, depreciated, killed off, however you want to phrase it, from both Office 365 and Office 365 GCC. And it will only support TLS 1.2. So this is something they've been talking about for a while, but they just finally announced the date when everything's going to get killed off. And if you are using TLS 1.0 or 1.1 somewhere in your environment, or some client application is using that to connect, you should see a message in your message center where it says, hey, something is using TLS 1.0, 1.1, go figure out what it is, and you might want to fix it. They do list in the article here some of the following clients that are known to be unable to use TLS 1.2. It's like Android 4.3, Firefox 5, IE 8 through 10 on Windows 7, Internet Explorer 10 on Windows Phone 8, Safari 6.04. So just one of those things you're going to want to start preparing for is that removal of TLS 1.0, 1.1. Make sure everything you're using supports TLS 1.2. Upgrade as necessary. But yeah, definitely one of those announcements that came out that you don't want to wait until the last minute when everything breaks to take a look at this. Ooh, yeah. So there's probably some interest. I honestly I thought this had already gone through because like you said, they've been talking about it for a while. I think it was like depreciated and they said, hey, we're gonna kill it off, but they had never given us a date of, hey, we are completely cutting you off on this day. Gotcha. So 
Yeah. The other thing I would think about there is we're kind of talking about just the context of Office 365, but it's not going to be just Office 365 that's impacted by that. Say you run SharePoint server on-prem. So now you've gone through and maybe done like client upgrades, or let's say you don't do client upgrades, like you're still running Windows 7 for some reason, but you go ahead and run a GPO that says, okay, I'm going to force my clients to use TLS 1.2 so that they can communicate with Office 365, and then you think, I'm good, I can talk to Office 365. If you're running hybrid workloads like SharePoint, Exchange, anything like that, you might have some updates to do there as well. Like, you know, to enable TLS support in 2016, you got to do patching on SQL Server, you got to patch your SharePoint servers. It is the same in 2013 and 2010 if you still happen to be running those. So you could potentially have other workloads that your clients still need to talk to, right? Because they're sitting there, they're sitting on prem. Or heck, it might be like just like your HR system or your ERP or something like that could be totally host. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those that it could seem relatively minor, but very, could very easily cause a bunch of problems, which, again, it's nice that they gave you 10 months or so, almost a year, and they've been talking about it for a lot longer, so hopefully you've already been starting to plan for this, get everything on TLS 1.2, but I did see a couple messages in the message center from some of my clients that said, hey, you got something out there using TLS 1.0 or 1.1 yet? You better go check it out. So, Definitely some work people are going to have to do there. Yeah, they, they, they better get on top of that. Like, it's it's not so much the s- server stuff you got to do, it's the servers plus the clients plus the testing plus, like you said, the identification of what that client is and what else does it do and, and what's it got going on. Right. And in some cases, it could be like, I think some of my clients, it's third party software where it's like you got to actually go to your vendor and say, hey, this third-party software is going out and connecting to Exchange Online to relay email using authenticated SMTP. There may be third-party vendors that you're going to have to say, hey, are you going to get this in place in the next 10 months? Or what's the plan if your product that connects to Office 365 is not supporting TLS 1.2 in time? So, lots of fun around that one. <laughs> lots of spelunking into firewall yes, logs. Not <laughs> or, 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 or your CASB or whatever you got going yes, on. Yes, <laughs> not one of those fun announcements, not one of those flashy new things like new features, but one of those very important announcements you need to pay attention to. When it comes to email, Outlook and Office 365 are fantastic. But sometimes there are things you'd like to do that aren't implemented. Sperry Software creates Outlook add-ins and Office 365 services that fill in these gaps. For instance, there are Outlook add-ins to automatically print emails and or attachments, save emails to PDF, send out recurring emails, or how about a warning when you're going to do a reply to all instead of a normal reply? Find these and many more email productivity solutions. Get started today by visiting www.sperrysoftware.com slash cloud IT. There was a new feature that we could talk about, which is actually kind of like really fun and a long time in the making, yes. which I think will help out a bunch of organizations in SharePoint Online. Yeah, this one was a cool one and I've tried it already because I like living on the edge. This came out, some of the PowerShell commandlets, I don't know, I first did this like three months ago or so and it actually worked. But this is site swap in SharePoint Online. So if you have had SharePoint Online for a while, like I know I've had it for seven years or so now, um, my root site in SharePoint is a boring, classic UI Nothing exciting, nothing fancy. So if you go to mycompany.sharepoint.com, it's a classic site. Um, There were a lot of companies that were like, hey, we want a root site to be communication sites. Great, if you stand up a new environment, I think you get a communication modern site now as the root site by default, but old companies couldn't. There is now a PowerShell command, invoke-spo site swap, that essentially lets you take a source URL, so it doesn't have to be a root site, but it could be a root site collection, and then a target URL, and an archive URL. And what this will do is like swap sites around. So it takes like a 
child site if you stand up a brand new communication site and then issue this command to swap it with your root site, it'll take that subsite, that brand new communication you stood up, put it at your root site, and then I'm trying to remember what the archive URL does, but it, it essentially just moves all these sites around within your environment so you can replace a site at a specific URL using this PowerShell command. This is Definitely one of those you want to check out if you have a site at the wrong URL and you kind of want to put a new site there. You can do this site swap command and flip all your SharePoint sites around and rearrange which URL a certain site is at. Yeah, so I guess this one's kind of interesting. And just being that you said you ran it, did it take a while? Because it's not a, even like looking at the commandlet name, it's invoke SPO swipe swap. It's not like, Hey, do this right now, kind of thing. Uh, run it through, which imp- and it talks about how it's a job, right? It invokes a job to swap the location of a site with another site while archiving the original site. So does does it like have like a lag? Like, what's the delay there? The impact? So it was a while ago, and I can't remember, but it didn't seem like it was too long of a delay for me. It seemed like it only took. I mean, it did say take some time because, like you said, you're moving site collections around and doing a whole bunch of stuff. But I want to say it was like a matter of minutes. It wasn't an instantaneous two seconds later it's done. I think it was like maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes or so where it took to move everything around and archive stuff and swap it. And as I was reading through this, it does. So those three commands, it takes the source URL, puts it at the target URL, and moves the site that's at the current target URL to the archive URL. So that's the whole process. That's what happens sometimes when I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. Takes me a minute. I need you to talk so I can read for a second. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. don't need to read. You should know this I should stuff. Know this you already stuff. ran it. It was three Come months on. ago. I have short-term memory loss. or No. <laughs> I got so much stuff bouncing around in my head. Takes me a little bit sometimes. But yeah, it was, I mean, it was relatively quick. It wasn't instantaneous, but it wasn't like it took 24 hours to go run this. I think it invokes like a job in the background and it may take five or 10 minutes to run that job. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just wondering, I understand the way I've seen a lot of organizations go is they have, you know, now they have their full internet built out and it's sitting on a site collection that's sitting off on that other URL. So if you're going to swap a, whatever, say a, like a five gig site collection to your root site, which has been empty because all it had was a redirect on it or, or whatever it happened to be, then you know what does that look like and what's the impact to you? Yeah, basically it's, you got a test, huh? But you, it's not like you have test tenants. So you might have to go out and sign up for a test tenant, load some data, migrate it and see what happens. Yeah, or even take a couple, I mean, go stand up a couple site collections in your production environment and just swap a couple child site collections. Go swap test one, like company.sharepoint.com slash sites test one and sites test two, and swap those around just to see what happens, put some of the stuff on there that you're doing. So definitely don't just kind of go out and do this. I would definitely do some testing because of all the stuff that kind of moves around in the background. So there are some requirements to around what PowerShell version. It's SharePoint Admin PowerShell version 16, 8, 8, 1, 2, 1200 or later. I think the PowerShell version is the only... No, there are some, it does have to roll out to tenants too, because I think I tried this once, and it said my tenant didn't support this feature yet. So even though you have the PowerShell version, you will get an error if your tenant doesn't support the site swap. And then once your tenant supports it, it'll go through. There's also some requirements here around hub sites. If it's associated to a hub site, you have to remove it from the hub site before you can do site swap. So go read all this documentation around the invoke SPO site swap commandlet. And that's that's about all the information there is on it. There's not I haven't found any other good documentation on like a walkthrough or examples and all of that. It's pretty much just go read the documentation for this PowerShell command. To go <laughs> look for other people blogging about Excellent. it that have tried it. I tried it, but I didn't blog about it. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should start blogging more again. Well, way to go. I'm Nah, you can always talk about it. PowerShell comes across really well when you just talk about it in voice form. Yeah, because all the commandlets and parameters and all that don't get confused in anybody's head whatsoever. It's not like pictures or documentation not, not helps it's, with this stuff. Yeah, it was cl- clear as yeah, well. Yeah, good. Me. Perfect. <laughs> No, maybe I'll try to do that. Maybe I'll go spin up a tenant and run through some of this stuff and try to put a blog post together. 
I say that, but you know how much free time I have. Oh my. <laughs> Anything else? We should probably wrap up. I actually have a meeting I have to get yeah. to. I need to leave in like three minutes. Yeah, yeah, no, we got real life to get to. Yes, that we do. Never ends. So, thanks, Scott. I have PowerShell dragons to go slay. Yes, go play with PowerShell. This kind of turned into a PowerShell-ish episode with a couple news articles. All right, go slay your PowerShell dragons. I'm going to go to my meetings, and we will talk to you later. All right, thanks, Ben. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.